Hi, Rakesh. Okay. Hi, Tony. Hey, Bunny. Hi. Hey, Rakesh. Hey, hey Shibai. Hey, Todd. Are we waiting for anyone else to join here? Or... Uh, I think uh, uh, Freeman and maybe Patrick. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, Patrick. Hi, Sajay. Patrick? Hello. Hello. Hey, Sajay. Hey, Sammy, hey man. Hey, Yi, Sajay, hey, Vani. Hey. Hey, everyone. Hey, Sammy. Uh, I think uh, we have all the people from our side. I'll just check if uh, Samir is going to join. Oh, Samir is here. Hey, Samir. Hey, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we can start. Uh, okay, uh, maybe I can share the screen. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can see it. Before we get started, do we want to confirm the meeting time for the future series? As you know, uh, the winter time is coming. Yes, in... I'll, I'll pre uh, yes. Uh, I and he spoke about it, and uh, yes, he can prepone it to 4 p.m. PST. Okay, great. Uh, how about the other? People, uh, Toddy, any comments from your side? No, time is fine. So, um, 4 p.m. in uh, in, in, in PST means 8 a.m. In, in Beijing time, yeah. Okay, cool. Just yeah, as uh, yeah, euro in, in, in Beijing time, yeah, cool. I think for you guys, there is no uh, change in that meeting time. For us, there is change in meeting. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Freeman. Uh, let's check the agenda item. So there are three items. Uh, the first one is about the trust policy UX, but this one uh, could take time. Uh, maybe we can start from the Rakesh. Uh, 
this issue firstly because this issue uh, was reopened so we need to understand the reason so maybe rakesh you you can start with this one firstly the second one yeah sure um, i added a comment to the issue uh, the gist of it is that uh, we need to notation needs to can you hear me yes i can hear yes rakesh we can hear you uh, notation needs to pass the extended critical attributes to verification plugins and currently these verification extensibility spec says that the attributes key has to be a string but looks like as part of cozy support we modified the attribute key to interface and um, currently there is no way to support interface keys in uh, golang json package um, even if there is even if we add support then there may be some collisions like um, there may be a key uh, with string and uh, another key with a number uh, which may be um, colliding so i uh, I found this issue when I was testing notation with our plugin. Um, the current um, unit tests are not covering this case, but uh, um, looks like this is a bug in notation now, and I'm not sure what is the way to um, resolve it. Um, anybody have any idea? Uh, so I think we need to update the spec instead of changing the interface. And also, uh, for four as int and four as string, uh, there are definitely two keys. There, are, it's not a collision. There are two keys. Yeah, they they are separate, but the current specs and notation are not supporting them. Uh, yes, so we need to update the spec. Um, so there, there is going to be additional work. Uh, I'm not sure how we want to track that. Do we know roughly what the cost is to update the spec? If it's just about kind of calling out that this is the case? Um, I think it requires some investigation. Um, currently, the spec um, um, just says that keys are strings, but if we need to add additional details like the type of the attribute, then that is going to complicate things. I think we need to think through this and update the spec. Uh, because if you are passing uh, the types to the plugins, uh, then I'm not sure where else we need to uh, support that. So I think we need to um, correct. Look. So uh, so I don't I don't have enough context on this. But uh, so what you're saying is that the keys are objects right now, but you don't know how to serialize them because you don't have type information. Is that the root cause? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. So this came in as a part of the cozy work. Uh, for JWS, this is not a problem because keys right. are always strings. Uh, but in cozy, keys can be numbers. So yeah, it is part of um, cozy work. So uh, I think I would kind of like ask Patrick to maybe investigate this because uh, we cannot have arbitrary serialization types, right? That's an attack vector also. Sure, uh, I'll take a look. I mean, either we close out on the spec saying these are the supported types, or we define a way in which the type information can be passed in. Uh, wait a second. Uh, so yes, uh, JSON does not support uh, keys. Uh, that is not a string type. However, if we can have an array, as we already did now for now, that says you can have an array that is uh, in an array item, you have the key and the value, and the key type can be anything. Hold on. Are you saying that? 
uh, can you clarify that like in how in the key type can be an array is what you're saying uh the attribute array so it's not it's not a type uh, i mean it's not a map uh, it's an array so because a uh, it's an attribute array that means each attribute can have a key field and a value field yes oh it's a key value field array okay and but the key types can only be strings of what the specification says or used to say right uh, you used to be it, it should be yeah, anything uh, sorry it should be what it should be anything how do we know what type it is then so so currently uh, for json we support json supports numbers strings and objects so right. So it's already supports number, so I think it's okay. So JSON keys can only be strings. I'm not sure what you mean by JSON supports numbers and arrays. Shiva, can you clarify that? Uh, sure, uh, I'm, uh, I'm having the link. Wait, wait just a second. Okay, well, maybe while Shiva kind of gets to a place where he can respond, we can take up the next issue. Uh, okay. Uh, there okay, is only two wait. issues. I think the other issue also we need, Shiva, <laughs> to respond. So we need to. Yeah, he's, I think it's the time that he gets to office also. So, yeah. Or... Oh, okay. Yeah, how about the way we discuss the first one? I'm opening it. Uh, so actually, uh, after beta one release, we enabled the verification uh, using trust store and trust policy, right? However, uh, the user needed to uh, configure the trust policy file. And actually there are several uh parameters in that uh, trust policy file user needed to specify a correct value and also this file need to be uh stored uh, in a directory uh, however this directory path is uh, is different uh considering different uh, os so it's uh it's very cumbersome for the user to to do that uh and also uh you you can see this uh Trust policy JSON file uh, example. Uh, for example, for the registry scopes, currently uh, these stars only applied to a global scope. So we cannot specify the star uh, for for the registry and the repo path. So that means uh, for the user, if they they are mending repos, uh, needed to use the same policy, user has to uh, put many different lines of repo paths here so that's also a lot of work for for the users especially considering the dev uh, environment there could be many repos on the registry uh, so they are also uh, they are already compliance uh, if you check the uh, community uh, the channel and also some some issues uh, that discuss about this so we needed to figure out uh, some improvement what we can do for rc1 release uh, i'm not saying that we needed to completely develop something new to address this user experience uh, i think we can uh, prepare for a phased approach that we can see considering the RC1 release timeline, what we can do for improvement for RC1 release, then we gradually improve it, uh, uh, maybe in RC2 and also uh, before the stable version. Yeah, this is Samir. I wish Milan was here to talk about it, but as I recollect, let's go line, can we go line by line on this one? I'm just trying to reframe 
uh, in my mind, what is a mandatory requirement to be in the trust policy and what is not. So can you uh, scroll up a little bit? I just want to see one complete policy. Um, uh, which? Yeah, whatever example you were showing was fine. You had an example you were showing, right? And let's just go back to that example. You would have, yeah, let's stop there. So version, yeah, I think the trust policy is version control. So if we decide to do any improvements, we can always use the version number to do some improvements in the trust policy down the road. So it's not a one-way door. You see the first thing in trust policy is the version number itself. So if you decide to simplify trust policies or add other models, I think we, it's not a one-way door. The trust policy is version control, so that's good. Second, uh, I'm just interpreting the JSON file here for my knowledge. The registry scopes, I believe the registry scopes is an optional parameter, not a mandatory parameter. Can somebody confirm if the registry scopes is optional or mandatory to be in the trust policy? It is mandatory. Uh, it's mandatory. Uh, users need to either provide uh, fully qualified names or it can be a wildcard um, like it is okay. shown in the, on this. So if, so if it's a wildcard, it could be a wildcard uh, of the wildcard representing the anything or just a registry or a, or even a file name. So it's up to the user, right? So So registry scope is not a big lift. Uh, is it? Actually, the wildcard can be only used for for this uh, for a global scope. That means only wildcard can be input here. So if you have a registry, a repo parse, you cannot put a wildcard into that part. So yeah, that, that means if you, that. yeah, yeah, I think we had lots of discussion on that one to keep it to to keep it like that. Um, okay. I think we can go back and look at the notes we had from that time, but it was on purpose to either have it down to a file name or to a, or to a repository name, but not put wildcards there inside the repository names. Uh, Rakesh, the signature verification level, uh, this is also a mandatory requirement, right? This is, and trust uh, store, yes. of course. It okay, is so mandatory, everybody... only trust store and trusted identities. I think those two fields are optional if signature verification is um, skipped. If okay. the signature verification level is skipped, then trust store and trust um, trusted identities are optional. Got it, got it. So now that we talk through it, those things seems intuitive once you talk through it as to why they are there. So Yi, your concern, or I think there's a hand raised as well. I wanna see the floor. So your concern is these are too many parameters or this is uh, not easy to configure because there are too many parameters? I think all of uh, these are needed. Uh, uh, it's, Todd it's, is uh, raised his hand. Uh, hey, Todd, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I kind of added some comments there, but I think the biggest concern right now is uh, asking the users to actually go and manually create the file. Uh, that's the, the biggest thing. I do have questions about the kind of the justification that we do not want to have wildcards in the uh, repositories and the, the paths there, but we can table that for now. I think the first thing we need to solve is what is the experience for actually users to go and configure this trust policy that does not require them to manually go and edit this JSON file? I think that was one of the feedback, right, in the channel, right, he, that one of the person did configure like four or five characters extra and it started erroring. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is this is what we've been talking about from the beginning um, of this trust policy thing of having some option to where they don't have to hand copy paste JSON. Um, so we we need something i think there even if it's you know a, a template that needs a, a one minor tweak um you know 
It is still, I mean, even if they are creating it, if there's an option to create it via the CLI, um, that, that is still a manual user interaction. We're, we're obviously for security reasons, not gonna just automate like everything open. You know, there is still some command line that has to be run to get things created. So one of the proposals that I, I have is we can solve this for the, the test case as he is proposing. So when you generate the uh, test certificate, we can add a policy that this test certificate is done. However, I think we need to be smarter on how do we do that with, uh, let's say, real certificates. And we need to put a little bit more thinking around uh, what the experience there will be. Because editing this file and actually configuring trust policies for various, uh, let's say, uh, repositories, registries, and so on can become a nightmare uh, once the actually you have a, let's say, Kubernetes cluster that needs to support 10, 15, 20, 100 different uh, uh, registries. Is, uh, is it an option to provide, like David said, a template? define the template and then uh, narrate it in the startup guide is that an option well uh i do think that from scenario point of view i don't know whether the template will will help but like when you need to add additional certificates uh, during uh, let's say certain scenarios how are we going to merge those templates or whatever the proposal is? The parameters remains the same, right? The value changes, isn't it? Based on the scenario itself. It's not like we are going to add an additional parameter, right? Yeah, if, uh, for example, here, if we, we cannot use the wild card, so any any time we have new repository pass, we need to edit this file, right? And also for the certificate, once we have a new certificate, we need to figure out what is the specific identity. So that part also requires some expert experience or any other tools. You can dump the identity from that certificate, then add it here. So it is not just the, that easy just to copy something here. Although it is already common, sense, you, you still need to figure out what needed to be put here. And, and you also need to make sure it is uh, correct. Shiva just um, responded. Hey, Sami, you have. Yeah, Shiva and uh, Sajay, I just check in the chat. Yeah, notation initial. Should we also respond to this uh, some, some notation initial command? No, uh, yeah, I, so thank you. My hand is up is let's get the use cases right. I, I, I believe we're getting good information uh, as to, as like Todd, you were saying, um, I'm, that I'm, what I'm are the work here? here. Yeah, I'm actually hearing two scenarios since you're talking about use cases. One is notation getting started is really difficult. Um, acquisition. Initializing, you have to copy paste like a bunch of JSON all. We know that this was a gap. So I think uh, prioritizing that work is important. The second one I think that Toddy is bringing up, and I don't know whether you've discussed this, modifying the policy to be able to add a new repository or add a new cert or trust uh, mm -hmm. scope and things like that, that's missing. So building of the scaffolding plus kind of like managing this is, is two things that we haven't focused much on the use case itself. Um, I think that work is not even prioritized, let alone define it, right? So uh, getting getting to a place where we can say, um, for SSH and all, we already have very good patterns. Like you do SSH add, it gets added to the store. If you, um, if you have, uh, what do you say, repositories that you're going to enable in this, you have commands that we can use to do things like repository add to a specific scope and whatnot. But that workflow is not being defined yet. Uh, the JSON is probably good enough unless we decide that we want to introduce another version that supports arbitrary hierarchical scopes. We stepped away from that. I remember the conversation. But for this time, should we at least identify 
these two use cases that is getting started we need to prioritize uh, including acquisition of notation and the second one would be modifying the trust policy from maybe from a cli or if there's anything else should we do that yeah i think those two use cases sound good sajay i think my only comment was that are we think, like i was thinking when we were making this you're right we we had punted some of this work about how to simplify it but I'm going to, I want to go back to the use case that Tori pointed out that there could be in on, on Kubernetes clusters, lots of repositories we're bringing the things from. I was thinking people will be, and this is a disconnect I have in my understanding. I was thinking that people will be basing trust on the signature, not so much on where the image is being pulled from. Right. If that signature exists, that means it's a good image. So we don't, so in normal cases, we will not go very granular in defining for every image or for every repository, because you are saying okay. if it is signed by this entity and with this identity, we are good right. to accept it. So can we, uh, Yi, can you pull up the notary project trust policy doc? Uh, that'll probably clarify the discussion. And Toddy, you can confirm, answer me if I'm wrong. Today, I think we can take an actual concrete example. For example, um, a customer deploys of a like, uh, EK, EKE or an uh, AKS cluster or something like that. For our scenario, we have about 50, almost like maybe 20 to 30 images that are all in different repositories. And if you look at the sample for the trust policy, it will actually be a full set of each of these repositories, which might be the case. And it's, I'm, I'm not saying we should change that, but at least we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of repositories that we need to add uh, in that if you look at the current trust policy sample. So maybe we say that, yes, you got to bundle all your repos under this trust policy and this is how you do it. But then when you add your application on top of that, that you're bringing from your ECR or your ACR or Docker Hub, you need to be able to configure another trust policy that does not collide with the previous one. So there's got to be some separation there. And uh, um, you can go to Notary Project, Notary Project, it's there at the root. Yeah. Uh, below, below. Uh, that is, uh, yep, that's the last one, last link. Last link. Yep. Yeah, I think some concrete examples like Sajay, you are absolutely spot on saying we may have uh, not thought about it at that level. Right. So if you scroll down one more, the example will kind of describe what I'm trying to say. So look at this. So you have registry scopes in the top two. So you have two repositories. And then uh, if it's if it's your own software that you're signing with your key that you're bringing as your platform, right? Like AWS or, or, or Azure or something like that. Right. And you have a blown up list of about 50 to 60 images that you're kind of like bringing as a platform. And then below that, or maybe a, a besides that, you will have the customer's applications, which is signed by their key. And so you they would allow two sets of keys by default, at least for any of the providers that I'm seeing it as. So we just need to kind of like solidify this, uh, if that is the experience or uh, EMs on the call should kind of say, no, 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 this is really <laughs> something we need to work on. Um, yeah, but we can have uh, more finesse at this point. That's kind of what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, I wanna comment on this one because this is a kind of a good example, but uh, a little bit simplifies what we need to do in, in our cases. So. Uh, that's why I was asking, okay, why don't we have, let's say, wildcards? If you look at the first trust policy here, you have registry, ACME, Rockets, IO, software, net monitor, and net logger. If I have like 20 or, or 30 of those, is the expectation that I go and list all of them? Or can I just say ACME, Rockets, IO, slash software, slash star to actually trust everything that is there? Then uh, the second thing I want to mention is we actually have bigger hierarchies that actually we need to, to configure, uh, especially in multi-tenant services where you, for example, were using Kubernetes that is managed by, let's say, the cloud provider, but then you have application from the cloud provider that is running on Kubernetes, and then you have also the customer on top of that. So you have at least three sets of uh, registries that you need to enable. And some of those registries, they may be in the same, let's say, uh, uh, locations. Like, for example, Acme Rockets IO software uh, can be uh, the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, provider. Then Acme Rockets.io slash uh, 
another software can be the the kind of the application that sits on kubernetes but then you have like todsm.io slash for my customer images. So I need to have at least three trust policies that I need to configure there. And there may be like hundreds, I would say, if not more uh, registry scopes that I need to configure and different registry scopes need to be actually signed with different keys. So the, that complicates kind of the creation of these trust policies, at least in my opinion, knowing all the scenarios that we need to enable. So I got an idea, basically, <laughs> a wild idea, by, but let me narrate it, right? So are, will there be anything under the software that is not trustworthy, that's not supposed to be uh, trusted? So is there an, that might be only a couple of them, but in order to define, Todd, for your point, out of 100, you might have 95 to consider but there might be just five that you should not consider. Hence, the wildcard is not um, is not in scope for that case, right? So that is, yeah, that is very good point. So you have actually a low and deny lists in the in the case. Exactly, in case. that's where yeah. I was going. Yeah, exclude list. I was about to say, yeah, a low and deny list. Yeah. So we, yeah. when we designed this initially, this is granular enough at this point. I think we agreed that we'll revisit the wildcard scoping exclude deny list as a second iteration. So that's the other thing that we should probably talk oh. about. So it's not that the spec was done, but the spec is good enough to kind of like define a JSON that can take in a very concrete, uh, unambiguous list. That was what uh, Milan was talking about when we initially came up with this. So I think we are at the second round where, yes, we want a little bit more flexibility. So um, I, I think we should at least open an issue saying that, okay, we need a way to kind of define a larger set, more arbitrary uh, and exclude deny lists if needed. Uh, because implementation is also challenging. The reason why I remember now is that if we added wildcards, we would need to handle things like, um, uh, ex like if there are collapsing lists, right? Like wildcards match, if it matches software slash, should it match software slash something slash? Or if you have overlapping lists, okay. should we kind of exclude that? So we wanted to keep all that away at that point in time. But I think it's come to time where we're closer to release and defining that might be a good good thing um, if that is what we should do. Um, so I'm just giving context on where the decisions came from. Yeah, yeah. The, that makes sense, uh, Sajay. And I agree. I don't think we should reopen that right before the release. Uh, I guess here the question is how we can actually make it easier for for startup and we can concentrate uh, uh, on really when I go and test how this policy gets created automatically for me uh, as a user. So I don't need to manually go and type it in VI or, or, or anything else. And then the second Thing that I think we need to do as action item, and that's maybe for next release or the release after that, is how we can make it uh, uh, easily modifiable without uh, the need to go and parse the whole um, JSON and uh, in, in inject things here and there based on uh, addition for policies that come from, let's say, users or higher level uh, users of the of uh, notation. So I think the immediate, just the immediate need right now is really for a tester, how we can generate that without them asking them to go and create a JSON file and place it in some directory on their machine. Yeah, I think yes. I'm open to ideas on that one. Uh, but Jody, just one last question for my clarification, because you're opening up a use case I wasn't very really tuned on. I agree with you that there could be three sets of trust policies, like you explained the application level, base level, or the platform level. I think that's that's a good way to think about it. There are at least three, three or four different mm -hmm. set of trust policies. I'm with you on that one. What I'm still a little uh, thinking about is uh, on the registry scopes, yeah, there can be more than one registry. I get that. But wouldn't a simple registry scope of star be sufficient there as long as you say the signature has to be signed by these identities. Like I'm still trying to understand from a customer perspective, you, you're familiar with registries and containers more than I am is why would scoping be required to that level? Why wouldn't we just trust on a signature? Why will you have keys on a per registry basis? 
those were some of the things you said. So I'm just curious about uh, what is yeah, that use my, case? Yeah, my, my answer right now to that will be the um, um, solar winds example. So solar winds is signed with, with a key that is trusted and you have no way to invalidate any software uh, without invalidating everything that's signed with this key. And uh, very often what the uh, kind of the exploits that are happening are somebody's account got exploited for, for certain amount of time. The signatures are actually, uh, the, the software is signed with the key. And after that, uh, you, you actually regain access of the account. And uh, so you don't wanna invalidate everything that is signed with this key. If we put star that is a, too broad of scope. So uh, my experience in security is that actually star should not be used. Uh, and as, as uh, uh, we just discussed, we should have like uh, a low and a deny list that actually are more granular on that. So I think that's why the registry scopes were designed and we don't want to use star in this case and just rely on the, on the signing key because I may wanna say, I trust, everything from this registry that is signed from this key but i don't trust like uh, things that are coming from this registry to be this other registry to be signed by this key because that means that this key got compromised and some somehow somebody signed something else somewhere else uh with with this key okay. so those That's are kind of the, the 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 like solar winds that even like many exploits happened with this way that somebody steals the key and goes and actually signs it and puts it somewhere else to be distributed. Okay, hey, David. I, I think I'm convinced now. Thanks. Hey, David, your hand is down. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually um, going to be stepping uh, away from the notation ORES projects and Todd is going to be kind of taking effectively kind of kind of like my place so i just thought it was important to give that context um because you know you might be like who's who's toddy who's this guy <laughs> um <laughs> but uh but yeah so um yeah Yi and fin finman will still be will still be doing, doing what they do and um yeah I'm, i'll be on for probably this this will be pretty much my last my last week okay that's yeah. Thanks, thanks, David. I think uh, uh, Sajay introduced me last week uh, at some point okay. of time. But yeah, okay. nice, nice to meet but everybody. Just kind of make make the make the connection now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Okay, so back to the ideas. I think we have a couple of ideas for discuss that a trust policy can be created by default. That's one idea. I think I threw an idea out there that we could have a sample trust policy in there, which is commented out and people just un uncomment and add their things. And it could be those three or four levels that, that Tori described. I'm talking about what we can do in the short term and we can bring some new ideas after the launch of RC1 uh, because it's not a one way door a trust policy versioning being present already. So I'm open to ideas if we have concrete ideas to go and work on. Uh, I, I think uh, firstly for a beginning, a beginner, uh, I had a proposal that uh, to uh, use the notation third generate test to create a policy for a beginner. Uh, I think this is uh, doable. Uh, an, another one is that uh, we, we could uh, uh, create a new command as uh, uh, Sajie and Shirwei suggested to uh, introduce notation initial, this command to do some work for our users, like putting a trust policy template into a certain directory path that uh, Fits for the OS that the user is working on, and with that template, we have we have comments on different parameters to guide the user how to do it. The user then can maybe just uh, for some cases they just uncomment some parameter. For some cases, they can uh, by figuring out based on the comment they can uh, customize theirs. So, so I have two proposals. One is to address the beginner 
to reuse this uh, notation third January test for testing purpose. Another is to, uh, for considering the other one uh, timeline, we can uh, initiate some, some uh, stuff for our user to start with. So are you going to, are you going to add the scope for our C1 and then post our C1 in the same issue? Uh, I so think if we... uh, if everyone here we we are aligned with this, I can then add this to proposal. Actually, I already have the first one. Uh, okay. I will and the second one proposal, for example, to introduce notation initial command to initial okay. something. I will list what uh, the command will list uh, will initial for our user, but. Uh, but before that, we needed to align with that we, whether we should introduce this command or we can reuse some existing command. Uh, creating trust policies with this certificate command um, doesn't look right to me. Um, these are two different um, things, right? I think if we can have a draft on uh, notation init command, I think that would be um, clear for us so that we can take a decision. So can can we uh, split this in, in two? Uh, so he has two proposals. One is the uh, generate test, which actually generates a simple policy and puts it in the right plate for the test certificate. And the second one is the init command. So most probably we would like to have two separate issues for that one is just to address the first run experience uh, with generate test and the second one is to really discuss uh, what the init command will do and uh, eventually is that the right way to go or whether we need to do something else or use the certificates or some separate command uh, this way we can actually split it in two and uh, for the first run experience something that we can include uh, whatever the kind of the most appropriate next release is uh, to, to include it, while the other one may take a little longer to, to have a discussion. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I totally, uh, I just want to make sure that the second one, the initial uh, similar command, uh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, will this be done for RC1 or post RC1? So RC1 is in two weeks, right? Three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I don't think that the init command should be in RC1. Uh, I I would like it to be in RC1. I think it's too destabilizing. And I right now, because I just actually read the idea from Shiwei and, and Saji, I would have some comments on the init command, what exactly it will include, uh, similar to uh, like uh, uh sorry i'm still trying to uh, rakesh uh, right you were mentioning that or somebody else was just uh, uh mentioning or samir one of you two actually was talking about the uh, init command and the spec for that yeah rakesh was i think rakesh's point was he he will not like to overuse the search generate command to generate address policy even uh, i think that was a comment from rakesh yeah, because this will, uh, so the, the init command, for example, what does the init means in this case, uh, I will also have question because init means initialization. If I need to add uh, a, a scope later on, then that doesn't sound like init command for me, right? Are you so talking that... about the modification as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because init is just the definition of it trust policy but later on if you have to keep on modifying it then definitely it's not an init command right? yeah definitely so we'll need a different command so i think like the first run experience is really well defined because it's a test one so if i run a generate test i know that i'm generating a test uh, a certificate and hopefully everything will be testing so that can be wrapped up in in and really contained while after that we need to really look at the scenarios uh, more in details. Shivay has his hands up. Shivay. Uh, yes, so uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, for the notation init, uh, it's used for the uh, out of box experience. So uh, so someone if uh, they install the notation, they can use direct directory by using okay notation init. The init will generate a default config file, a default trust policy file, and with some maybe putting some uh, default uh, trust stores from uh, maybe GitHub with some root trust uh, uh, certificates in it. And then the uh, user can simply do notation verify the image or artifact and then process the artifact or image. Uh, obviously, it's just a default experience. Uh, the, uh, the user can uh, use notations, uh, third add, delete, OLS to modify the uh, trust store. Uh, of course, he can uh, or she can um, I use the uh, notation policy commands that in the dev branch to uh, modify the policy. So it, it completes the, the entire experience. So what are we aligning here for, uh, for the phased approach, right? I think we are talking about the entire kind of short-term, long-term solutions, but what is the phased approach? What is the first step, second step, third step, and how, how are we thinking? So, uh, and also I'm, uh, I'm curious on our uh, development model. So currently it seems we are doing uh, something like a waterfall that we define everything correctly and then you implement it. So how about we do it iteratively or we do something like prototyping that we develop something first and then see, okay, whether it's reasonable or not. If it's not, it's not reasonable, then we remove it. If it's reasonable, okay, we add it and then we keep it. So it's, uh, it's, it seems that uh, that process will be quicker and faster and reflects the problem we have quickly. Uh, Shiva, are you suggesting we will write the code first and then uh, get alignment? Uh, maybe, yeah, because uh, I think we are uh, we we're just discussing, but we don't have a conclusion. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that is going to be a good use of resources. Like if you are not aligned on the proposal itself, I then all the developer effort on writing code would be use useless. Uh, uh, we can uh, have proposals on this um, issue and probably discuss in our next meeting. Uh, looks like uh, to me there is some sharp um, edges or steep learning curve uh, for users to get started with notation. I don't know if we can um, uh, provide a quick fix by uh, providing good documentation uh, for now or if we need to think about notation in it or any other commands, um, let's see those proposals in the issue and we can discuss in our next meeting, I would say. So let me uh, just ask uh, the following question. So Rakesh, you think that uh, a notation search generate test should not be used for generating also the trust policy. Is that correct? Yes. I would agree with As that. As a user, when I look at that command, um, it, it is supposed to generate a certificate that to a test one. I can't imagine um, um, like updating trust stores and policies with that command. It would be too confusing. So, so I, I, one thing I proposed in the issue was if somebody does the generate test and there is no default trust policy, that there's a prompt of sorts um to say oh we noticed you don't have a trust policy would you like to create one right so that it's not just the doing magic and there's no idea of what's happening yeah i uh, also have the question uh sorry rakesh go ahead uh just a comment on david's proposal um i don't know if we can do that given that rc1 is going to be a backward compatible version like once we have a notation in it or notation trust store trust policy commands, which are going to be first class commands for dealing with the policies and stores, then we can simply remove uh, this confirmation on generate test right. Um, I, I'm, I want to. I'm not suggesting. Go... I'm not suggesting that you would remove it. 
I mean, I think you could just, it would just be supplemental, right? So like if, uh, if you initiate, for instance, if you, if you do the init code um, for the trust policy, the prompt would, uh, once that code becomes more, you know, in the code or, or more robust, then you would just, you would just, you know, use that code. It would just, the yes confirmation would reuse that same, same stuff that's there. Um, why do we want to provide two different ways to uh, set up trust policies? I would rather prefer if there is only one way, uh, a long-term supported way. There'd be one path in code, but then there, from a user experience perspective, you'd have different elements that would detect that that's not there, right? Because if somebody tries to verify, so there's different scenarios where when there's no trust policy that exists, um, it'd be nice to have them not have to figure out that they need to type, you know, the init command next. I, I also have the uh, question. So what is the value of, for example, adding a certificate without uh, adding it to a trust policy? Why would somebody add a certificate without actually putting in any or defining whether it's trusted, not trusted, what registry is trusted for and, and so on? Uh, so certificates can be generated on the signer's side and added to trust policies or trust stores on the verifier side. And most of the times, these are two different personas. So uh, actually, the certificates itself, like certificates, they are used mostly on the verifier side. I, I, or at least that's kind of uh, the way I look at it. The keys are added on the signer side and normally you don't have the key. So it's not a good practice to have the keys on the local machine, right? This is only for testing purposes. So when you sign, you want to have a trusted environment. So in general, you don't want to have the keys on every build agent that you're running, right? So you want to send the, the request to a HSM and do the signing there. Uh, while the certificates, which is, I, I see them more into the verifying scenario. And in the verifying scenario, I do not understand why would I add a certificate without adding a, a trust policy if that makes sense. But so the, the only, the only, the one use case that I can think of is if somebody were to, uh, and this gets back into the key discovery element. So if somebody were to, let's say, download a, uh, a, a key, um, ideally automatically, but I mean, even if it was manual, if we were to down the road, give some level of like, you download it to the, the trust store, but you know, you don't necessarily trust it, trust it until you add it to the policy. So there's kind of a, a layer of abstraction, right? So if we, if we downloaded the key and then we had like a certificate inspect or some other, you know, verification mechanisms on top of that certificate being there, that would be a scenario where you would have it in a phased approach. But that's just, okay. but that's just an idea. Yeah, there is one thing to download the certificate. The other one is to add it to the trust store. So once you add, I add the certificate to the trust store, I am kind of starting to trust it, right? But it is not clear what I trust it for. I don't see like in the notation cert, there is no download command to go and kind of verify it. So I, I, I think kind of we need to think a little bit more about the, 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 bigger scenario not just like if that kind of yeah no i totally know what you're saying yeah we get you got to think of the indian scenario i mean that's why that I yeah think that, that key discovery I, the, the key discovery and the what do, you know how do we how do we what's the future of making things easier for somebody to trust you know public content right um that's signed yeah you that's know, how, 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 I, and, and once again going back to what rakesh said so Yes, they are two different actors, but I, I, 
for the signing part, right? Okay. Um, anyways, we are running out of time and kind of we are getting into the design. Maybe it will be good to describe the scenarios. And uh, so I think we are, we do not have any decision right now. So we are thinking of addressing this as documentation. Is that correct? What I hear as consensus? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we'll address this as documentation for RC1. Definitely, we have to go through all the scenarios. In fact, we have to document all the scenarios and we need to come up with the proposal, right? Else, we'll forget the scenarios. All the good talks is going to fade away. So, yeah. we need to probably document all the scenarios and then go through the design approach through each and every scenario, whether it is applicable or not, right? including yeah. the exception uh, scenarios that you spoke to yeah yeah and and uh, uh so i i already uh, sent you a message on slack so we need to look at kind of what are the important things to document uh, uh so maybe next meeting we can take a look at that sure sure hey so jay and samir your hands are up for quite some time so go ahead go ahead sajay first Sajay, you're muted. I cannot hear you. Oh, I wasted time. Okay, so we we got <laughs> one more issue on the hack and B. Um, the other thing was we had a three second startup issue on the notation CLI right now. Have we prioritized that issue? I I somebody mentioned that actually this issue is closed. Um, yeah, I think Pritesh worked on it, and it should be. Last week, it was worked on. That issue was worked on. So, and there was a pull request also. Okay, I just ran notation from main right now. It's not okay. I'll follow up with you. Evan. I don't think it's merged. Then I think okay. it's addressed, but not merged probably. All right, so that's there for RC one. Right? We want. We want. Yes, it is. It is part of RC one, and uh, okay. I think that yeah. is one of the <laughs> issue that he and I decided that we'll take it up and close it. Uh, yeah, hey, the, uh, Rakesh and Shive, before we drop this call, can you can we get back to the other story, story eighty eight that were, that got reopened? Uh, Shive, uh, I think. So I uh, I think we should address it in this meeting. Otherwise, we have to wait another week. Uh, so can you go back to the previous agenda? So uh, yeah, I think the the issue is. Uh, is more critical in the spec. So as you can see uh, in the spec, the, there's a, there are two fields. Uh, e, can you uh, open the spec? Yes, uh, there's a spec, uh, yes. And you can see there are two uh, fields. One is called critical attribute, another is called unprocessed. Uh, attributes. So uh, they are all critical ones. So as you can see, the first one is critical attribute. It has an extended attribute, which is the map. That is, we have a, a string key and any uh, type of values. And uh, there are known attributes. And there are also, there are uh, unprocessed attributes. As you can see, uh, it has some comments on it. It's an array of names of critical attributes that is not recognized. So, and that's an array, it's not a map. Since it's an array, uh, we can have key value and the critical uh, Boolean values in it. So uh, you can you also open uh, another uh, link in the chat window I have posted uh, to the code, uh, I mean, to the notation call go code. Which link? Uh, um, uh, I checking. think it's the first link. Uh, in the chat? Yeah, it is in the chat box. Okay. Opening. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, so as you can see, uh, uh, the extended attribute is an array of uh, attribute. And uh, for the uh, attribute structure, you have the key, critical, and the value. And, and uh, because it's a, it's not a map, it's an a object. So the key, the key, it can also be any type uh, other than string. So we can accept integers. 
and uh, and also I think the current spec also allows a specified integer other than a uh, string uh, in the unprocessed attributes, and the unprocessed attributes are also uh, can also contain critical attributes. Uh, if there's a confusion about the cri uh, critical attributes and the unprocessed attributes, we definitely need delay. Uh, we definitely need to uh, revise the spec. Um, I did not get the suggestion here. Uh, Shiva, we need to provide the critical attributes to the plugin, both yeah. key value pairs and keys in a separate uh, array, which are not processed by notation itself and notation is wanting the plugin to process, right? Yes. And in a map, the keys have to be strings. Yes, but, but in, if yeah, if a ahead. cozy cozy signature envelope contains a critical extended attribute with yeah. key as integer that can't be passed to plugins. Uh, they can the uh, problem, they, they right? can pass they can pass via the unprocessed attribute in the spec. There's a field called unprocessed attribute. So you can you show that uh, spec? Yes, this, this field. Yes, and it says array of names of critical attributes that the plugin caller does not understand and does not intend to process, but it will be passed to the plugin, and the plugin can may, maybe may, uh, understand that attribute and process it. So, so we uh, need to pass those attributes uh, in two forms, right? Um, on extended attributes, we yes, need to are, send that map. Yeah, there the are no attributes. Phase. Yeah. So, so extended attributes spend... are uh, extended attributes are known attributes, and there are also unknown extended attributes. They are uh, they are in the unprocessed attributes. Um. Yeah, the unknown attributes, they need to be passed to the plugin, right? Both key value pairs as well as keys in unprocessed attributes. The map doesn't support numbers, number uh, keys. Tell me, I'm not sure. Me note that it's an array. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a map, it's an array. As you can see, it's uh, on, the, on extended array. attributes, it's a, it's a map, right? We need to pass. Uh, I think. But, uh, yeah, but extended attributes to... are known attributes, and all known attributes has has string type keys. If it's unknown, no, like extended we, attributes can be unknown as well. No, it's not. If it's unknown, then uh, then it should be in the unprocessed attributes. Uh, I can clarify what these fields are. So in critical attributes, we have extended attributes, right? Um, which can be um, unknown and in that we provide both key value pairs and then we have unprocessed attributes right that is notation telling the plugin that these attributes are not processed so you need to process uh, process them uh, it is just a list of keys but the values are present in extended attributes uh, and notation has to set these two things uh, before calling plugin the issue here is for cozy envelopes, there can be number keys and those can't be passed in extended attributes. I can but, I can send you the code references. Um, yeah, but then, then, it's got a, it, then it's got a problem. That is, uh, as you can see, uh, if uh, extend attribute, uh, I'm saying that, uh, okay, uh, uh, even though it, it takes a map, how, how about those uh, non-critical attributes? Can they be passed to the plugin? I don't see a field that we can pass uh, non-critical attributes to the plugin. Uh, we don't pass non-critical attributes. Uh, the spec says that only critical, like if a, if an attribute needs to be processed by by a plugin, plugin it needs to be marked as critical. And then uh, that I don't think this uh, spec is complete. Uh, I, I don't think we need to 
update the spec to say that um, unprocessed, uncritical attributes need to be passed, but um, the spec needs to be updated to account the case where keys can be numbers. Uh, I think that is the work uh, that uh, Sajay said Patrick needs to look into. Um, but yeah, that is the problem. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I propose that we need to review the spec of the verification plugin. Yeah, this is the plugin extensibility spec. Uh, this yeah. needs updates. Uh, and also these fields uh, are not well documented actually. Uh, yeah. uh, until we have um, uh, like a proposal or spec update or update from Patrick, can we update notation to um, support um, string keys uh, because this is currently blocking our plugin. We are not able to invoke our plugin because um, we can't marshal interface keys. I'll, uh, I'll take a look. Okay. Um, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Is there anything else for today's discussion? I think uh, on the two PRs, I think one PR has the update in and the other PR uh, will send an update today sometime. I'm looking at the verification one. It's a lengthy yeah. one. So uh, I reviewed <laughs> half of it. Uh, I'll try to finish it as soon as possible. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So E on the on the trust policy one, uh, will you be able to update the uh, go forward strategy? Oh. Sorry, and then we can we can create an issue as Todd said that for the scenarios to be covered for post RC1. Uh, I think uh, the current conclusion for RC1 is only in the documentation work, right? Correct, correct. But you're going okay. to- I, I, I will create two issues, one for the documentation work and another one for the scenarios and we can iterate on those. Okay, uh, and uh, thanks, Todi. And the scenario one will be post uh, targeting post RC1, right? So the documentation yeah. will be marked in the RC1 scope. Yep, yep. Okay, then then after that, I think I can close this uh, trust policy UX in RC1, this issue. I have created an issue in notation to document the for RC1. Uh, Toddy, assign it to you for right now. We can figure out who needs to own it. Uh, you have a good example. I want to capture that. I have a quick question before we disperse, right? So my, my understanding of how containers, customers will use this is getting a little bit challenged. I'm just trying to understand if you define the registry scopes here, will those scopes also need to be defined in say ratify policy or the gatekeeper policies. I'm just trying to see where all will these registry scopes need exactly. to be defined. Let's just took a high level view of that. Yes, so these scopes will all be, so Maradify uses the same trust policy, right? Because it's using the same uh, libraries. So this policy file or some form of this will have to get propagated across. And if you add a repository, you have to kind of like make sure that the list is updated across the places. So that is a, that's one of the reasons why having a simpler policy makes it easier to make sure but it also makes it dangerous because um a wild card kind of like exposes a lot as well so but they're both pros and cons to it so. sorry sajay i was not clear so i'm sure ratify has to bring in the trust policy to pass it to notation library Correct. i was more thinking about the gatekeeper or the admission controller which will be calling ratify does it I also have to have registry scopes or the containers uh when you start a container cluster on eks or AKS or Kubernetes, do you have to sp specify registry scopes there as well? I'm just trying to understand where all will these scopes need to be defined? 
uh, forget right signature now, verification everywhere else right now the configuration uh, uses a gatekeepers one feature called external data provider and the external data feature kind of passes in the request saying that a deployment is happening with this specific image digest uh, or image at least and then components like ratify uses that to resolve okay this is the image i need to go uh, look into trust policy i need to go pull the signature and it does all that so it knows only that it's trying to deploy an image within maybe something called as a namespace or some permission boundary so these scopes don't kind of currently pass around uh, it's only within whoever understands the notation uh, libraries or implements the notation verifier does this because even cosine and things like that is also built on top of gatekeeper as an external data so that's going to be generic enough let me just ask it one more time a little bit differently imagine we are not verifying signatures imagine there is no signature verification do do cluster customers or kubernetes customers define registry scopes to the level of granularity which Toddy was talking about somewhere else today forget this signature verification i'm just curious if containers customers go to that level of definition for their images even there without are, I, there, there are customers. Yeah, I can they usually yeah, authorize yeah, I mean, they usually authorize uh, the cluster to have access to a particular registry to pull from. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that answers my question. Sorry, I was not asking it right. Thank you. Back to you, Vani. Oh, sorry, I was talking on mute. So I think. Uh... We should be good now. And uh, is there anything else from anyone? No from my side. Samit, uh, Todd, Rakesh, Shibe, Patrick, David, Sajay, anything? No, I really want to see. Uh, do you have anything <laughs> left in the agenda? I have just one question. Uh, so we have a document writer that actually he is not in the notary project dev team. Uh, and I cannot assign directly the items. So he needs to reply to the item in order to assign it. So do, you, do people mind if we add him to the team somehow? So it's much easier to assign items while they're filed or? Well, Dori, my understanding of uh, GitHub is if he if he likes one item or he adds one item, then it gets in the system automatically. He, no, I, I think you have to add them to the notary notary project members. Um, yes. Or, he needs to, oh. Yeah. So what's my... It, David has those super rights, right, right, David? That. Yeah, I can, uh, I can, I can, I can help with that. I just, I think it was good to just bring it up just to make sure we're all, we're all good. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank all. Thank you. Well, I'll... have a nice evening, everyone. Have a nice day, folks in China. Hey. That's yeah. Good day. Yeah. Good night for folks here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye bye. 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 bye.